if you look at a graph of the increase in malocclusion, it kind of slowly increased after the, the Neolithic Revolution, but it just took off after the Industrial Revolution and skyrocketed even more after the 1960s. And Mike Mew talks about this. I think it's because the most important factor in it is uh, the lack of breastfeeding. In the 1960s, uh, women were liberated. They stopped breastfeeding as much. Your, your skull is most malleable when you're a child. You know, your sutures are most open. And that's when you subconsciously habituate mewing. I think that's the reason. I think people need to breastfeed more. Obviously, if you have like someone that's under the age of eight and they weren't breastfed, if you teach them proper tongue posture, that's going to do a world of difference for them. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing you can do for a kid is breastfeed them. And they were breastfeeding their children for up to like three to five years. And now people don't even do it for like five months, if at all. I couldn't agree more with you. I'm a huge advocate of maximizing the time of breastfeeding. I think like minimum two years. I think the more the better. I know Michael Jordan was breastfed till he was three. I know that in Mongolia and in a lot of uh, Muslim cultures where breastfeeding is considered a right of the child, they'll yeah. go up until age five Why or six. Because if you just think about it from an evolutionary biology point of view, first things first, right? As soon as the baby comes out, well, what do we start with? What's the only real environmental factor that's in your control for the first year or two? It's just breastfeeding. That's the way a baby can mew. How do you get a baby to press his tongue up onto the roof of his mouth? Get him to suckle his mother's nipple. Because when the baby yeah. reaches out and clasps the nipple, it trains the tongue to go up and forward as compared to a bottle, which is yeah. longer and allows the baby to habituate having his tongue rests on the floor of his mouth, the milk just falls in, he doesn't even have to work for it. Mm -hmm. And then when he's resting, when he's not suckling, if he's been breastfeeding, the tongue will just naturally go up and forward and serve as the natural palate expander. This really started kicking off in the 1960s when, you know, women, they stopped being homemakers. It just, there was a huge cultural shift. Breastfeeding started being seen as oppressive or it's representative of women being subservient. So the baby sort of got thrown out with the bathwater where something yeah, that was in fact good got associated with something that may be negative, which is women not having the liberty that they wanted. And so they stopped breastfeeding, not realizing that there would be huge negative effect on the baby that came from that. All right, Aiden, uh, we have a 60 minute chat this afternoon. And uh, why don't you start by introducing yourself, telling us uh, where you're calling from and what you hope to accomplish with this conversation and how I can help you out. Well, I, I don't think uh, you can help me out too much, but I, I think I wanted to give some advice about my personal experience. I think a lot of people could benefit from it because me and you and that other, a lot of the other people that you've interviewed that have done MSC are kind of like pioneers in this, you know, uh, and there's not many people doing it. And I think they can learn from, you know, our experiences. For example, I wouldn't overexpand like that guy said. Uh, I think uh, I looked a lot better mid-expansion, and the breathing benefits were maximized then. And another way you can limit asymmetry, actually, I heard, is that you can, if you just wait, well, if you look at the MSC screws, keep monitoring the MSC screws while they're in, and then if they get a little crooked, you can just wait, and eventually the bone will harden around it, and it will straighten out. That's what I heard some girl that got MSC, she was talking about it on YouTube. I forgot her name, sadly, but it seemed like pretty good advice. Um, and yeah, but I suppose I'll, I'll start out by talking about how I got into this and my experience with orthodontics. Yeah, so let me just step back for a super quick it? second, Aiden. So so you want to come on today to share more about your experience, get, your, get the word out yeah. there about what you've learned. And so you've had an MSE. Mm -hmm. You've had a ton of expansion. Yeah, well, I'm not sure how much. I think probably as much as you, but it might have been a bit more asymmetrical. If you can tell by my face, my nose is a bit flared out here, and I, I do have a cant. I don't know if it's as bad as the other gentleman you had on there. He does have a lot of asymmetry, but he looks handsome as hell, I got to say. Good-looking chap. <laughs> hey, you're not too bad yourself, brother. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> but like, but, uh, can we see? Let's, let's take a look at that smile. Show us what happened. Yeah, so your See right that? side, just like uh, just like Ryan, your right side is way out exactly in the left like field. Exactly like him. Yeah. But I, can I, I see think the roof you of your mouth? Too. Can I sure. see the roof? So massive, though. I mean, you've just got a massive maxilla Here, let me show point. you a picture, I think. 
I think it'll do it more justice with my expansion. Let's just see if this works. This is me pre-expansion, pretty narrow maxilla. And let me show you my face pre-expansion as well. So narrow. You know, you can see the crow's feet very, very prominent. I don't know if the light can show it. Which but crow's feet? What do you mean by that? Explain that to people. The under eye shadows, mm -hmm. because I have very weak under eye support. Mm -hmm. um, and now it just kind of blew up, you know? Mm -hmm. Just like a huge change. Jeez, man. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think the, the benefits do get maximized probably around four, but if you do want extra tongue space, I think that would probably help your sleep a little bit. But it's not going to help your sleep unless you have room to mew. Because that extra tongue space is going to be wasted if you can't hold a suction and mew. You know, why does it matter if you have tongue space? I suppose it'll get it out of the roof of your mouth, but it's going to keep falling in if you don't have enough front-to-back space. Because you're not going to be able to hold that suction mew and breathe at the same time. So, yeah, I think uh, double jaw surgery and MSC are going to have to be really complimentary here. Mm -hmm. uh, and can we see, um, just before we dive into discussion i just want to get a little yeah. bit more raw data can we see the cant of yours so just close your lips like this yeah so it's a little bit it's mm -hmm. not it's not yeah. terrible with your lips closed and if you smile again yeah you so, so just and like it, ryan it's the the lower side is the side that got super expanded yeah yeah so that seems to be a thing right like when the MSE blows out one side way more than the other, that side also goes lower. What I think happens is if you get into a Brody bite, perhaps the maxilla doesn't have support. It's not on the, it's not connecting. If you don't have that contact, it's going to sink down with gravity. That's what I think happened. Sort of like Stephen Hawking's face. Uh, you know his face because he did, he had muscular dystrophy and his tongue didn't support his face. And so... If he had muscular dystrophy, he probably had an open mouth posture all the time, and his mid face probably just kept sinking down, like most people do in society, because they don't they don't mew. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, great point, man. Yeah, so th the fact that the super expanded side just doesn't have anything supporting it from underneath, because it's in what you said a Brody bite, which means that there's mm -hmm. zero contact between the upper and lower, and then just due to gravity, it'll just fall. That may, exactly. be, that may be a, a contributing thing to why the expanded because side I think, goes lower. I mean, you had a Brody bite too, but I think you got into Invisalign quick and got your bite stabilized. I had a long time before I actually got Invisalign. So just don't, if you, everyone, anyone listening, don't overexpand. Four to six millimeters, like, I would do like 60 turns on it. I think 60 turns is good. 40 to 60, probably 50. Probably 50 turns is my recommendation. Uh because, yeah, the tongue space doesn't matter as much if you can't actually mew, which I still can't, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyways, I still think I look better, though, um, despite the asymmetry, and I would still get it again even if I had the asymmetry. But, of course, I think I look better mid-expansion. If you can see, before and after, I think people would recognize this. This is me mid-expansion. I look rather handsome there, you know? Yeah, and, uh, yeah. I, look, I still look pretty good there, but uh, the asymmetry does worsen my appearance, I would say. Uh, you look good, man. You look good. Yeah. Yeah. And then this is me. I look sort of like the village idiot here post my orthodontic treatment, right? As a child? Pretty gnarly. Well, this is me before MSC. Okay. Like, this is what they took before MSC. And this is me after. Like, I look, you know, a fair amount different. I don't know. Yeah, like you my face is different. You look super different, man. Yeah. No, you yeah. look, you look significantly crazy. better. I mean, bone structure is just... it's. It's crazy how that will cha change your appearance. Here's another example of just how much bone structure. I should have organized my notes better. What the hell is this? Here. See, this girl, she had double jaw surgery, right? I don't, oh, man, this light. Let me see. No, it's fine. It's fine, man. Now you can see her face a bit better. Do you see that? Yeah. Like, look at, look at what double jaw surgery did to her, man. She's just like... You know, and you know what I'm saying. It's, yeah, she went from a bone total. Bone so important. Yeah. 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 Exactly. She looks like a nerd. I mean, she doesn't look that bad. I mean, I think retronathia doesn't affect women as much. If you see this gerbil boy, the infamous gerbil boy, he looks way worse with retronathia than her, I would say. But she looks way better with good jaw development. Well, she way went better. from she went from being 
you know, dweeby looking and whatnot to being, uh, you know, essentially a model. Yeah. Most mm-hmm. people, I think, have good enough baseline genetics to be models. They just need to expand and uh, put their jaws forward. And I would also say, if you're going to get jaw surgery, what I would do, I think most people are more than two millimeters recessed. And why that's important is because jaw surgery can only move your jaws two millimeters forward, right? Unless you do multiple jaw surgeries, I don't know if that's possible. But what I would do, since most people are more than two millimeters recessed, because, you know, John Mew says that Paleolithic humans, they had a, they had a millimeter, or not a millimeter, a centimeter behind, uh, maybe not a centimeter, but they had a good amount of space behind the wisdom teeth. And most people don't have enough room for their wisdom teeth, let alone their regular teeth. So yeah. When you said that surgery could only move you two millimeters forward, did you mean two centimeters? Did you mean two centimeters? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, 20 millimeters, sorry. 20 Forgive millimeters, me. right, because two mm-hmm. millimeters is... Is Not, nothing, yeah. Yeah, that's nothing. You can get that with, with tooth tipping. Well, yeah. two, two centimeters yeah. is a huge amount, man. I mean, like, God, going from... It's not enough for most people, though. Most people are, like, four centimeters probably recessed. Because most because Paleolithic humans, they had about a centimeter behind their wisdom teeth. And I'll show you what I mean by that. I would, this is a man who had really bad retractive orthodontic treatment. And Bill Hang was talking about him on this Stop Retractive Orthodontics YouTube call. And, uh, I mean, look at his... Like, he got double jaw surgery, and he's still super recessed. You know, two millimeters just was not enough for him. And if you think about the Two centimeters. Boy, centimeters. Yeah, two centimeters. Yeah. Because you can only move the, the maxilla forward two centimeters, or else it's not going to be stable. Um, perhaps you could do another surgery or something like that. But, yeah, that would just be, you know, my advice for people who have or are looking into getting MSE. And also, the the Mew and Catch-22, I want to reiterate that. You know, don't don't get hung up on trying to, like just like mewing 24 seven. It's just, it's not going to work. I'm sorry. I don't want to burst people's bubble, but I really don't think it really, it works in adults. You know, your bones are too hard. Yeah, I have. I found out a bit about this stuff. Well, let me, let me uh, back up and give some context about myself. Sure. And how I got into this. So I get some pictures real quick. So when I was a child, I was a very happy child. Uh, very happy. Uh, I had pretty good facial development too. You can see I was a bit of a mouth breather in this photo, but you can see that my. Is that you on the left or the forward. right? The left or the uh, right? It's on the right. That's my big brother. I'm the sad one. That's my big brother giving me a, a little, you know, jostle. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can see from this picture, my mix up. Like I was pretty handsome. I looked like the gerbil boy before uh, his mouth breathing stint because, uh, yeah. Like my maxilla is far forward, I look a lot better. But at, I was I was just so happy, you know. But after my orthodontic treatment, you know, everything just it just uh, went down the drain, you know. Uh, I, I, that started when I was 11, and I was I was just so tired all the time. And I remember walking around the halls of middle school just absolutely in a daze, like in a fog, and I would just put my head down all the time, and I couldn't figure out why. And I I kept looking at my appearance, and it kept deteriorating. I kept I was like, why am I getting ugly, you know? I thought it was like, it was really odd. Like I started to develop crow's feet and I was very insecure about that. And and now I know why. Uh, yeah, braces, I think, I think this is, I think, I don't know if there's studies about this, but one can assume that braces themselves, not even with rubber bands or extractions or headgear, can cause craniofacial dystrophy. Because what you're doing is you're like restricting the palate's growth. The wire is smaller than the palate and it's meant to push the palate in. So it's putting a lot of negative pressure on the palate, so it can't expand. And I also had rubber bands, and when you wear rubber bands or headgear, you get apneas immediately after getting them, like not even like once your face is recessed. Because they put pressure on the back of your maxilla, you get, like I felt tired immediately. But it just uh, it became a vicious cycle, and I became more and more tired. Uh, and yeah, I just my, my, my childhood after I was 11 was horrible before it was just great I was like I was really popular actually because I think looks are pretty important uh, I'm not you know a lot of people are gonna are gonna say that looks aren't that important they really are I mean you can't beat around the bush looks are like really I mean people care about looks you know yeah especially and, uh, especially as a kid you know yeah. um, the, uh, ugly kids, ugly kids just seem to naturally end up 
huddling together as kind of the geek group. You know, geek yeah. geeks almost being a geek is almost not even about being like intellectually a nerd or, or something. It's mo- almost just about your facial structure, if you think about it. Yeah, that's pretty much what it is. And when I was in fourth grade, I was super popular, and uh, and I don't blame people. You know, like this is this is my maxilla. This is me in fourth grade. I just look like a, a cute, you know, cute kid. <laughs> I have uh, look. I, I had a little bit of a overbite. You know, I had some crooked teeth. But my maxilla was far forward. And you look so happy. I, you look happy in that I was, photo. I was very happy. I was very happy. I was just a happy, worry-free child. And I became very depressed. I, I, was, I was basically suicidal. Like, my, after I was 11, it's really hard to describe the anguish I felt. To put it into words, like how much anguish orthodontic treatment has actually caused me. I would pro- I would, if, and, and the brain damage, too. I mean, those are the most formative years of your life. And you're just not getting enough REM sleep. For like six years, think about all the brain damage that I've suffered, all the potential IQ I've lost. Even though I fixed my sleep apnea now, I've just I've lost so much. Um, and yeah, you'll you'll never get those nights of develop of of a growing brain back. Yeah, I just I won't, you know, and I just gotta live with that, you know. But, and I have a feeling um, that I, all of that sleep deprivation and resulting fatigue probably you ended up on medication or you self-medicated by smoking weed or something or I, i'm guessing well, i don't know and, and that's also actually. not okay that's i good. actually didn't i my self-medication was actually probably cross-country i did that later on in middle school and i just became like a rail i think i became skinny as a rail i would just run all the time it made me feel a lot better i think it's also because i had less body weight and uh it, it opened my airway a bit because I was so skinny, you know, there's more room in my neck. Sure, and also one way to get oxygen in, even though you're underdeveloped, is to just run and huff, right? Yeah, it was probably, you know, the only time I really got proper oxygenation. But I think James Nestor talks a lot about breathing, and I think that's a very important aspect of craniofacial dystrophy. If you're constantly breathing through your mouth, you're constantly hyperventilating, and uh, that's just, uh, it's not conducive to proper brain function, uh, it's what's going to happen is it's going to put you in the sympathetic, ner- like your sympathetic nervous system is going to activate, and you're become you're going to become very anxious. Your amygdala will overactivate, and when your amygdala activates, it shuts down your prefrontal cortex, so it makes you a lot more impulsive. Um, and yeah, so but I think sleep's more important than breathing is what I was trying to say. James Nestor kind of briefly glossed over that in his interview with Joe Rogan. Um, yeah, it, I think sleep is uh, way more important than, than the breathing. I would say. Um, well, when you I mean, say sleep, important. when you when you say sleep, what you what you're saying really is breathing in your sleep, right? Because that's what determines sleep quality. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any because comment it, on that? Well, because I think being in the sympath- parasympathetic, like sympathetic nervous system while you're awake, it's going to make you a lot, you know, more irritable, anxious, less attentive. But it's much more important to be in the parasympathetic state while you're sleeping because you're not going to be in REM sleep if you're mouth breathing. Even if you're not getting, like, flow limitations, if you're not, like, if your jaws are underdeveloped and you choke on yourself and you wake up from REM sleep that way, I think most people do that, probably 80% of people. But even if you're just mouth breathing, that's going to worsen your sleep quality. And most people are doing that because most people don't mew or can't mew. And so most people just are getting subpar sleep quality. Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, for sure, man. And you made a comment before about your IQ being yeah. negatively affected. Uh, I can only imagine what kind of brainiac you'd be had you had optimal development because your IQ seems pretty unaffected to me. I mean, you're quite sharp. So, just well, throwing that I, out I there. I appreciate that, but um I I still think I would have been smarter. Um uh, yeah, definitely. Like my IQ, I, I would say probably raised about 10 to 20 points, literally. Like when I started using my CPAP machine, I was like, whoa, like what the, f- I was missing out on that for like six years, dude. Like, and I when, just, I, what I, age did you start doing that? Uh, I started doing that when I was, um, so I, like, let me, let me back up a bit. Sure. Okay. So sure. this is, uh, so this is, let's go through the years. Okay. So this is me first grade. You can see how happy I was as a child. You were happy. Happy child. Uh, Slow down. Slow down. Give each photo a little bit more love. Okay. It's hard to see because they're small. Yeah. But I was happy. And then fifth grade is when I got braces. Or not not fifth grade. I was still happy. 
And I think you can tell which year I got braces, right? Jeez, man. Don't tell me. Was it between 5th and 6th? Yeah. Oh, my good Lord. It's then, like uh, it's like you were, you know, the demon possessed you at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see here. And then let's look at this. 7th grade, right? I mean, you're smiling at least, but there's... But I was very... I was not happy, though. It's there's not no happy glow. Smile. I look there's, depressed, yeah. Yeah, there's no glow. I was very depressed, incredibly depressed. I would just, I would go home after, I would put my head down during school. I, I didn't care about school. I didn't have any friends anymore. I didn't have an active social life. I would just go home, just mindlessly play Call of Duty. It's a pretty good game, Black Ops 2. But uh, it's not something that you want to be doing for six hours a day, you know. It's not uh, good for brain development, I would say. Uh, it's very mindless. Because I didn't really have much brain power to do anything else, if that makes sense. And, sure. Uh, Eighth so, grade. Aiden. Yeah. In all fairness, just as a playing devil's advocate here, could there what what else could have possibly contributed to this drastic sudden change in your being and in your spirit besides the orthodontics? Could there have been I don't anything think else? Nothing else was happening in my life. I mean, you could say that teenagers just become like. You could say that teenagers just become like that, but. I don't. I don't think they become like really depressed and suicidal. They still have energy, you know. There was um, no, and this is prying, but there was no other trauma that you experienced besides the no, I mean, trauma. I didn't. I didn't have like a father growing up, but that didn't seem to affect me before orthodontics. I was very happy. I was like the happiest child, really. And like obviously, like that does affect you. Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it was the orthodontics, definitely. I mean, do you, you can remember? See, like, yeah. Do you remember like? Feeling those braces go on and feeling a distinct energetic shift in your spirit at that point? Yeah, like, and they hurt. They hurt like a bitch braces. Like, they're incredibly painful because they're pushing on your bone. You know, they're pushing your maxilla in and your maxilla. And the rubber bands were painful as well. And I, I, I just felt like shit, you know? And yeah. Me, so continue. Um, and let me show you a picture of... Sure. There we go. So this is me when I got braces in sixth grade. Uh, yeah, but like I was still doing kind of okay. I was playing basketball, but you can see like I was mouth breathing. Yeah, it yeah. hadn't fully taken effect of me. The effects of it. You look off in it, that photo. You look yeah. like you look like you're feeling some tension in your face. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, braces hurt, you know, it's like there's a lot of pressure. And I was I probably went through braces to like for three to six years on and off. So like while my face was growing, there was just a bunch of pressure stopping it from growing forward. And once I could once your uh, once your face gets to a certain point, it just becomes a vicious cycle because you can't mew anymore. And you don't even have to do any more orthodontics to mess it up. You just it's just going to go down on its own. Yeah. But orthodontics yeah. definitely speeds it up. And this is in 10th grade. I was, I was, wait, actually, let me show you my other orthodontic photos. So this is me before orthodontic treatment. As you can see, pretty, I mean, pretty, like, my facial development's pretty good. You can see I have wide cheekbones, pretty wide maxilla. Um, my bite's good, but I have a very slight overbite. For some reason, uh, my orthodontist thought he, he should correct that. My airway's quite good as well. So you can see. Mm -hmm. um, this is as a nine-year-old or whatever, an eight-year-old, eleven-year-old. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what what's really what gets me off about uh, doing orthodontics on a kid is because it's not necessary. Because overbites correct themselves with age, especially an overbite that mild. That wasn't really a problem. You know what I'm saying? Do you remember seeing my overbite? It was basically not there at all. Sure. Like, compared to this, like, this girl had a massive overbite, and it just completely corrected itself. Mm -hmm. And this is a note from Right to Grow. Um, this is a website that Omar Lalani made, and he had no, a very slight overbite, too, and his orthodontist just fucked up his face, man. Just absolutely brutalized it. Um, Aiden, oh when you're talking, make sure you talk into the computer, otherwise it's inaudible. Yeah, so you he were saying about Lalani? Yeah, Omar Lalani, he made a Right to Grow website because the same thing happened to him when he was 11 with headgear. And headgear is probably worse than rubber bands because they're putting more pressure on it. Uh, 
they're slight, it's, a, it's cervical headgear, so it's attached to your cervical spine. It's just pushing on the back of your maxilla. And this is his face before and after, right? Oh, my good heavens. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, he, uh, he just, you, if, if anyone's interested, you can go to www.righttogrow.org. I think he's making a documentary. You can probably send him an inquiry if you want to give him any information. You can write your own story, your own article on his website. But he just went through absolute anguish, and it kind of read like my story. You know, he just, he was just so fatigued throughout his entire childhood, and it just totally affected his life. You know what I mean? He just could barely function at all as a human until he was 27, and he realized he had sleep apnea and used the CPAP machine. Yeah. Yeah, let me, uh, let me share my own anecdote about my own childhood orthodontics. So as a lot of viewers um, of Jaw Hacks know, I dealt with chronic migraines from my freshman year in high school up until the present time. I mean, my headaches are quite well managed at this point, but they started in 2004 as a freshman in high school. Now, when did I have my orthodontics? In the 7th and 8th grade. So as soon as I wrapped up with my childhood orthodontics, I had four premolars extracted, and then I had four wisdom teeth extracted. Mm. So I currently have 24 teeth. And yeah, it was, and they got them, and you had them pulled back too, right? Of course. You know, they, 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 they chuck those premolars, and then they suck the front teeth back. And your Extractions are definitely going to give you migraines. Yeah. So, yeah, I can relate to having this traumatic orthodontic uh, shift in my health and well-being uh, in the 7th and 8th grade going into high school, and then my first migraines started happening in high school, and they never stopped. Now, I also did some other things in high school at, that coincided with the onset of my headaches. Number one, I played football my freshman year, which I think if you combine that with the changed facial structure was a, was a recipe for disaster. Right, because my mm -hmm. mouth got smaller, my neck posture got worse. Combine that with getting, you know, run over by some of the bigger kids with better facial structure who were the star athletes yeah. on the football Way team. Way more testosterone because they were getting REM sleep, unlike you. For They're sure. Breathing properly. The first time I remember feeling my headaches was I was playing football and I got, uh, I got ran over by the star running back on our team, this kid, Mike Levitt. He just. He was my friend. He didn't mean anything by it. He probably was only going 60 or 70% in practice, yeah. but he just <laughs> leveled me, and he really rang my bell. Like, I think we must yeah. have gone helmet to helmet. And then as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, and then that same exact experience, that. that same exact sensation, it would be my headaches forever after that, right here in the back oh. of my neck. Um, and I also started uh, drinking um, in yeah. high school at the same time that my headaches well, started. probably so. self-medication, you know. Might have been, yeah. Might have been. One, I think most people that do drugs and alcohol, I think probably it's because they have cranial facial dystrophy. I know that's kind of a stretch. I know people would say it's probably caused by something else. But you become incredibly impulsive once your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Uh, I think there was a case, what I've learned in a, an interesting YouTube video on it, there was this railroad worker he had, it was an interesting case study. He had like a freaking rod, like go through his like face or his prefrontal cortex basically, and he survived. But his attending physician was like, the balance of between his intellectual faculties and his animal instincts has been thrown out of balance. And before he had like an iron will, and now he, he couldn't, he became very irritable. He went to whorehouses and stuff like that, in and out of prison. So, and that, the same, the same thing happens if you're mouth breathing and not getting enough sleep. Your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he's the yeah. only railroad worker who ever went to a whorehouse, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe he was doing that before. Wow. Can you blame the guy? Work, work um, hard, play hard, bro. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, <laughs> yeah, this is an interesting study from... I, do you know Matthew Walker? He's, he's, he did an interview with Joe Rogan. He's like a sleep scientist. Yeah, he's the British sleep guy, right? Yeah. And like yeah, he, he's the man. He I love study. that guy. I could, live, I could listen yeah. to that guy for hours. He also did a really good one with Andrew Huberman. Oh, I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. Yeah, check that out. But um, he said 60% greater magnitude in amygdala activation in people that are sleep deprived. So your amygdala hyperactivates when you're sleep deprived. And uh, what happens when your amygdala is activated 
uh, overactivate it. It actually shuts down your prefrontal cortex. I think I already said this. So that's why a lot of people are, are walking around like constantly anxious because their amygdala is just in overdrive and that's the emotional center of your brain and you have no, your prefrontal cortex is supposed to keep that in check and keep your emotions in check and a lot of people don't have that. Mm-hmm. If they're constantly sleep deprived, which I think 80% of the population are based on Dr. Derek Mahoney's study. So doctor, so I think like, I think it's generally accepted that 30% of people have sleep apnea and like about 90% of those people have untreated sleep apnea, which is horrible. But, but he, he also measured, he measured a bunch of people with malocclusion and he found that 92% of people with malocclusion have sleep disordered breathing when you count UARS. Um, which is upper airway resistance syndrome. So you're not actually choking when you're when you're sleeping. It's not an apnea, but you're still waking up from REM sleep, basically. So mm-hmm. 92% of people with malocclusion have that. About 90% of people in the world have malocclusion, which is crazy, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so yeah, that's 90% insane, of 90% man. is 80%, you know? Wow. So that's, I think, that's pretty reasonable to say. It's oh, very man. widespread. That's terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, your point about the prefrontal prefrontal cortex, if you just think about how much everyone is running around now chasing cheap dopamine, right? Like everyone yeah. needs that quick fix now, whether it's yeah. whether it's Adderall, which is like, you know, a dopaminergic drug. It, all stimulants are dop- dopaminergic, which, which is to say like they feed that need for like instant gratification – you know, otherwise your mind is just so scattered that you're unable to, to do anything or sit still because your mind just yeah. needs it needs something to feed on. Yeah, um, yeah. My, my 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 friend at my construction job was saying the same thing. He had a, he had a divorce and he got raked over the the coals and divorce courts, and so he started using dope basically. And he said, you know, my grandma might give me shit for using dope, but everybody's on something. My grandma's on Vicodin or OxyContin, so you know everyone's just drugged up now. I think 3.3 million uh, American kids now are medicated for ADHD and they're taking amphetamines for it. Yeah. So that's yeah. crazy. And I mean, think about how much you know pharmaceutical companies are profiting off that. Oh yeah. Yep. And well, besides from the besides that, I mean, think about all the anguish that these kids are suffering. I mean, ADHD isn't like some like wonderful disease where like, you know, it, I don't think it's I don't think it's genetic at all. I don't think there's any benefit to it. I don't think there's any positive to ADHD. So I don't think it's like some like genetic mutation. And some people just have different brains that work better in different situations. I think having a very distracted mind isn't good. I don't think a person with ADHD would survive at all in Paleolithic times. In my opinion, I think it's probably uh, entirely, you know, environmental. And probably most of it's caused by sleep deprivation and amygdala overactive is overactive activation, which causes people to be more impulsive and sleep deprived children are actually hyperactive. But these doctors are like, well, let's just give them amphetamines. It must be genetic, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't really buy that. Yeah, I'm not sure I buy it too. And I think the whole thing is exacerbated by screens too, right? Because if yeah. your attention was already shit before and now you get a kid addicted to, um, you know, you know, high fructose media on an iPad or on a phone, it's just, it's over after that. Yeah. Also, how much? How are we doing on time here? I just want to like generate like how much more time we have in the interview. Yeah, we have another half hour. Um, okay, that's good. All right, bro. Where do you want to? Where do you want to pick it up from? Uh, well, I'd like to talk about pornography a bit. Um, I read this interesting statistic that uh, thir- uh, f- like fifty percent of thirteen-year-olds watch pornography on a regular basis. One more time, fifty and- percent of thirteen-year-olds. Yeah, and I would say that's probably not, I think it's probably more, if I'm being honest. Um, I mean, let's be honest, you know, I mean, I watch pornography. Everyone in middle school would just talk about it, you know. I think almost every middle schooler did, and probably on, like, a daily basis or every other day. And that's just horrible for a developing brain. I think we're just beginning to understand the harmful effects of pornography. And sleep deprivation definitely exacerbates that, just like it would exacerbate any other addiction, like Internet addiction, because you're more impulsive and your prefrontal cortex isn't working. I found myself, I've been able to quit, I haven't watched pornography about it for about a month. After I've, you know, cured my sleep apnea, it's way easier to resist. And before, I kept trying to resist, but shamefully, I couldn't, you know, get better and stop using it because I, I, don't, I, don't have, I didn't have the willpower, you know. My prefrontal cortex was just shut off, you know what I'm saying? 
Yeah, pornography is just another example of cheap dopamine that people will yeah. people will reach for if, like you said, their amygdala function is all out of whack. And it's incredibly powerful too. It's like it's like one of the most powerful drives. Like people think it's natural because sex is natural. It's not natural to see like fifty naked women on the front page of Pornhub. There's something called the Coolidge effect. And for every naked woman you see, so let's say you see one naked woman, that's one X dopamine you're producing. But if you see fifty, that's fifty X dopamine, because your body, your brain interprets it as, oh, I'm going to copulate with each, with each of these women, and I'm going to have, you know tons of babies. I, I won the evolutionary jackpot. And so it's just way more addictive than sex ever could be. And uh, also children, you know, shouldn't be having sex, obviously. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's very addictive. Yeah. So you're saying that uh, parents need to know about how harmful pornography is and just talk to their kids about it. be like, look, I know you probably you, you got to stay off that like they have to tell them because it's gonna it's gonna show up. There's like very sexual advertisements on Instagram and Snapchat that they're gonna see and their and their friends are talking about it. If you're not talking about your kid not to not use pornography, they're probably like they're gonna use it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I guess that would assume that a 13-year-old then has a smartphone. Is that right? Or a laptop? How else? Yeah, how would a 13-year-old yeah. get unlimited access to Pornhub? I mean, I had an iPad when I was 11. I think most 13-year-olds have smartphones at this point. Yeah, I would say that's too young. Man. Yeah. You know, so I'm with Cal Newport. Cal Newport is one of my favorite, you know, writers and podcasters. Uh, he, he has the Deep Life podcast. He says... Kids shouldn't get smartphones, untethered access to smartphones until age 16 or 17. He cites That's, a few, yeah. Re yeah. So he cites a few reasons why. One of the reasons he cites is because of pornography. Yeah, they're like, gonna they're gonna watch it, man. You open up Snapchat if you go on the right side, it's absolutely obscene. It's just it's just basically pornography. I mean, it's not like it's, there's no nipples or whatever, but it's just obscene stuff, absolutely disgusting. You know what I'm saying? And I think, you know, the pornography the pornography industry, like, maybe they lobby it or something. Because if they, they hook someone, they hook them for life. And they make a lot of money off that. Yeah, you know? so you got to understand. So I'm 32. How old are you? I'm uh, 20. Okay, so, what, damn, man. You're 20? You're like you're like a super brainiac for a 20-year-old. You're really ahead of your, of your time here in terms of maturity and in terms of figuring out the well, way yeah, the man. Like after I started using my CPAP machine, I just switched on. You know what I'm saying? I just like, I just w like would listen to podcasts constantly absorbing information. I started using my CPAP machine. So I got into orthotropics because I felt like shit in sophomore year. And I used to have a 4.0 because I was running a lot. You know, the cross country team, out of all the sports teams in our high school, they had the highest GPA. Because when you're running, you produce something called BDNF, which is brain derived neurotrophic factor. And, uh, and that's why exercise, like a lot of athletes are very smart, actually. And uh, because it, it evolved as an evolutionary mechanism, your uh, thinking is very calorically expensive. And in evolution, you always want to save calories. So if you're just sitting staring at a wall in a cave, your brain doesn't want to waste energy. So this evolved as a mechanism to only learn when you're hunting or looking for berries or new pads or doing something. And most people are doing stuff a lot. So... Yeah, they, it, it evolved as a mechanism to learn at important times. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's why a lot of people on the cross-country team were, you know, they had good grades, they had good focus. Um, exercise actually produces more dopamine receptors, so, uh, and that's important for, uh, you know, if you have more dopamine receptors, you, you can get more motivation to do things and get things done. Mm -hmm. But eventually I didn't have enough energy to exercise because this vicious cycle of orthodontics took a hold of me. And... Uh, yeah, and I just, my, my face kept sinking down. I kept, I'll, I'll show you, you know. I, I started looking like the Village Idiot. The Village Idiot by Chan Soutain. And I look a little better. I don't look exactly like that now because of the MSC. But if you look at ninth, uh, like 10th grade, it's like, bro, like, look at the adenoidalness of that face. And in 10th grade, it's like, you know, I'm just starting to look like the Village Idiot. I don't know how clear it is. Sadly, it's not the clearest. Maybe I should have blown that up before this. Oh, uh, that's okay. Uh, but you see that? I mean, very long face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you changed. And, uh, and I couldn't, I couldn't uh, maintain my, I was a very good runner. I, I like, I was very good at cross country, but I couldn't, I couldn't keep doing it. You know, I, I, I had to stop and I was like, why don't I have the energy to do this anymore? And I felt like shit all the time. And my grades, I used to have a four point and I couldn't focus anymore. 
You know, I used to be I used to be pretty bright. You know, I, like my favorite subject was history. I had a very artistic obsession with it, and I was like one of the best students in my history class. And I would just read the book constantly. And I was, you know, I was learning it good because I was running cross country and I was sleeping somewhat better because I, I was a rail and I had no body fat, so I was sleeping somewhat better. Um, but yeah, it just it changed and that vicious cycle made me not able to do that anymore. And I felt like shit all the time. I put my head down in school all the time, and I was like, why am I feeling like this? And I was like, I started looking at my face and I was like, maybe that's the issue. And I was like, maybe it's my posture. And I was like, well, that kind of makes sense. And a lot of people were saying brain fog was caused by poor posture. So I kept trying to correct my posture, and to my dismay, I couldn't. No matter how many exercises I did, I tried this for like four months or so. I was like rolling tennis balls on my occipital muscles, like doing all sorts of funky shit, and I just couldn't. And when I tried having proper posture and putting my spine in proper alignment, it just, I look hideous, and I can't just walk around like that. And it's, aside from looking hideous, having proper posture, I couldn't breathe because my jaws were in my throat, so I just couldn't maintain it. You know, and... Eventually, I was like, maybe, like, maybe there's something else going on here. Then I got onto orthotropics, and I tried to mew. I, I didn't like see your channel yet, or the mewing catch twenty two video. And I was like, I can just, I was just like sitting like this, like chewing really hard and like pushing my tongue up on the roof of my mouth, trying to swallow correctly, and it just didn't work. And eventually, like, I, I used the, I went, got like a sleep study done. They were like, you don't have any apneas. You just have UARS. You have some sleep bruxism. You woke up a lot in the night, but you're fine. You can just go home. I wasn't satisfied with that. I got a CPAP machine and it just totally changed my life. And uh, then I saw your channel and then I, I was like, that's what I got to do. I got to do MSC and double jaw surgery. I got to stop messing around with this and, you know, be serious about it. Get mm -hmm. this done. And uh, I'm, I'm still trying to get double jaw surgery, but I got MSC in May of 2020. I started using my CPAP machine when all this COVID stuff hit, um, this, this, you know, pandemic. And, uh, yeah, and like school went out early in like March of 2020. Like I didn't, my senior year ended in March 2020 because of it. You know, we didn't like do online classes. It just ended. And I had a bunch of time to just door dash and like do whatever and just really focus on this. And I eventually found your channel and I was like, I got to do this. I got to do MSC and double jaw surgery. And I would have done headgear more. And this is also something I would advise people who are trying to, you know, maximize their gains. Because most people are more assessed than two centimeters, you really want to do headgear. And, you, and if you're going to get good benefits, you need that constant pressure, and you need to wear the headgear 24-7. I don't think the amount of rubber bands is as, as important as just doing it constantly and having that constant pressure on it. And I think, you know, if you're like 18 or something or even older, you could probably get a good five millimeters of, expand, of forward growth. And I think that's pretty well documented. There's a lot of anecdotes of people getting that, even at later ages, if you just get that constant pressure. So mewing can work at later ages by that same concept, but if you don't have room to mew correctly, like, you know, because your jaws are too recessed, then it's not going to work. But headgear still will work mm -hmm. because, you know, does that So make I sense? just got off a call with someone who asked me about uh, a, a, he was frustrated with his results from his reverse pull headgear combined with his MSE. Um, he, had, he had been uh, using the face mask for six weeks for about 10 hours a day. That's just not yeah. enough, huh? What's a, what's a good I protocol? Do, I think you should do it all the time when you're not eating, you know. That's how much I wore my rubber bands, and that, you know, really did a number on my maxilla. You just got to do that in the opposite direction. That's what bone growth, how many because months? you're growing. I, I don't know, but I've seen a lot of people in your comment section saying, like, oh, I got five millimeters forward expansion. I've seen posts on Reddit, and, like, yeah, I think, and, like, in younger kids especially, reverse pull headgear works amazingly. And mm -hmm. so, I yeah, I just think constant usage of it you got to use it 24 7 if you're going to do this what i would do is just set off some like try to not get a job or like i know that's hard for a lot of people i had a job so i couldn't do it during the day and i couldn't do it at night because i was using a cpap machine so i was only doing it four hours a day that's not enough if you want benefits from the headgear you got to do it all day mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. yeah i agree with you and it's not because, easy for someone to yeah. do that which is you know why a lot of people end up getting excited about face masking you know yeah. On paper, it, it seems great, and then when it comes into putting it into practice, it's just overwhelmingly shitty. Well, what I would do, if you want to do it, do online classes or something. Like, think of, like, you know, uh, use, use long-term planning. You're going to develop. I mean, think about it. It's like it's your life, you know. Your maxilla's position, this is going to affect your whole life, you know. If your maxilla's a little bit more forward, you're going to look better. People are going to treat you differently, and you're going to be more healthy. And it's just a, it's a worthy sacrifice, I think. I would just try to do college but do online classes, you know, mm -hmm. because, I mean, you don't want to be in public with headgear. 
I don't think that's really reasonable to ask no. of people. But if you're really that dedicated, because, you know, you just can't. Well, I mean, I suppose kids can. I mean, they used to post up kids with cervical headgear in, like, middle school and stuff, and they'd just be walking around with headgear. Poor bastards. Yeah, Forrest Gump with his leg braces. Yeah, it's not, yeah. I mean, it's obviously not doing the kid any favors, but, uh, I mean, in the in the era of social media, right, I, I don't think, you know, that's a good idea to put a kid through that at this point, right? Someone snaps a photo yeah. of him, throws it on social, now all of a sudden he's a freak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, so... You know, you've obviously been through a lot. And what are your so? Tell us about your current status with your MSE and your orthodontics, and what are your plans going forward? Like, you are obviously extraordinarily committed to fixing this, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's what's ahead for you? Um. Yeah, I'm just probably going to get double jaw surgery later. Also, another piece of advice. Like, I'm just fixing my, uh, trying to get this, these teeth in. Maybe I'll correct my can't with double jaw surgery. I don't really know on that front. But I would also say what's very interesting is that my CPAP stopped working after about a year. S- similar to this Omar Lalani's, Lalani guy. If you go to his website, www.righttogrow.org, he says that his CPAP stopped working about a year, about a year into it. And he thinks it's because his, that, that pressure exerted on his, his pharyngeal muscles made them stronger and it made his narrow even smaller. Airway even smaller and so it, it just exacerbated his sleep problems and the same thing happened to me I, my CPAP just stopped working it might also have stopped working it it stopped working at about the time when I started over expanding so maybe that asymmetry in my airways stopped my CPAP machine from working but um, that's just you know a hypothesis I had but mm. I think it was probably because the the pressure of the CPAP you know made my airways you know narrow but how I fixed my sleep apnea I was basically I went a year in like absolute anguish. I was like, I was basically right back to square one before I started using a CPAP machine, and probably even worse. Um, and like working was really hard. Sleep really exacerbated how hard it was to work. Now I like working. Now that my sleep's corrected, it's nice. You know, it's like it's fine. I like working, uh, doing physical labor. But before I couldn't handle it, and uh, I was trying to get like a mandibular advancement device, but the Invisalign was kind of. I was trying to get my bike corrected, and you couldn't really get one that, you know, fit with Invisalign. They, you could, but they're very expensive, and I was having a hard time finding doctors. And I just, I came across balloon blowing in a forum, and someone was like, yeah, man, just, like, blow on an instrument, sing, or blow on balloons, and that'll that'll help your sleep apnea. And I was like, I don't know. But it really worked, you know. I, huh. I think I, I basically cured my UARS by just by blowing on balloons and singing. You're kidding and, me. No. So tell us more about that. What does that entail? Basic, okay, let me get some balloons. I, I have balloons all around here because I blow on them constantly. So you just blow on balloons. You don't inhale it because that would exert pressure on your airway, similar to what a CPAP would do. And what you do is you just blow on it and you just let it out, you know. And uh, yeah, you, you let the balloon blow out. You don't want to inhale it. And you just do that for like 15 minutes a day or more. Probably more is better. And after about a month, you start seeing results. This actually worked with uh, didgeridoos. There's this like uh, this trend called didgeridoo for sleep apnea. A woman cured her UARS, and she was in tears. You know, she was crying. She was like, "I can finally sleep again." You know, why does it work? it work? What's the mechanism? I don't. I that's. I know. I I'm pretty sure. I mean, I know it worked for me. But I think what happens is there's two ways that it works. Either it tones, it makes your uh, your air like the muscles of your airway less fatty, which I kind of doubt. I don't think that would really work. Because spot reduction is kind of a myth in fitness. Like, if you work out your ab muscles, right, you do a lot of planks, you're not going to just magically get six-pack abs. It's more about losing body fat. And, like, if you work out a certain muscle group, you're not going to lose fat in that area. You lose fat sort of like how water goes out the hole in the bottom of a bucket. So you have to – I don't really think it it works like that. I think it probably makes them stronger. And then what happens when you sleep, there's, like, a a vacuum in your throat. And especially if you have – a narrow airways there's a huge negative pressure that's exerted because uh when you inhale you expand your debt that's how breathing works you expand your diaphragm and then air goes there's there's like a a vacuum that's created because there's less there's more space so there's less air outside of your body than or inside your body than outside of your body so air rushes in so that creates a vacuum in your throat and sort of like a vacuum of a straw if you suck on it it's going to collapse you know uh 
And uh, I think it, that's that that's kind of how it works with an airway. And that's why butego work, butego breathing, and mouth taping work very well for curing sleep apnea as well. Because if you're breathing lighter, you're uh, you're creating less of a negative pressure in that straw, so your airway is less inclined to collapse. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But I don't know how like. St- Strengthening, I, th- I suppose strengthening it just makes the the, the vacuum harder to collapse, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's probably wow. how it works. So, um, do you? I would recommend everyone just try it. You know, I mean, I, I, why not? You know, does balloon blowing mm-hmm. do anything for the tongue? Does it help with mewing in general, or is it more about, like you said, working this part of the airway, the pharyngeal it airway? It probably work the back of your tongue, I suppose. But no, it probably wouldn't help with mewing much at all. Have you but tried you digeridoo? Read- have you tried didgeridooing yourself? No, I'm not going to buy a didgeridoo. I mean, it, it would just be kind of ridiculous. I do sing in the car, like on the way to work and stuff. If you look at an MRI scan of someone singing, their tongue is just doing crazy movements, and their soft palate is moving like up and down and back. Like you're really working the tongue out when you're singing and like doing different and talking, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's maybe why the tradition of singing in the military might have developed. Perhaps it helps people sleep better. That's just the hypothesis I have. Like you know how they do those chants. Yeah. Like I don't know in that movie, uh, Full Metal Jacket, they're they're doing all those chants in boot camp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, singing and, and chanting is a part of a lot of ancient traditions. Like uh, you know, uh, Buddhist monks do a ton of chanting, probably like one to two hours yeah. a day. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, that, so well, I mean, yeah. Y- you know, I, I don't know if you, you know. I don't know if there's a connection there, but. Um, but it's, it's interesting to think about how these habits we can pick up or these activities that we can do. I mean, no one associates singing with mewing or balloon blowing or playing, you know, wind instruments. Do you think like a saxophone or a flute or something could have a similar effect? Anything essentially that's causing you to push wind. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, I think like wind instruments, singing or balloon blowing. I, I can't think of anything else. Maybe like screaming or chanting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fascinating. Well, how are you that's a, that's a great that. tip. We've got uh, we've got some time. We've okay, got, I was you, just wondering. You know, I, have some, t- I have some more stuff I wanted to talk about. So we've got ten more minutes, technically. Ooh, it's but time. Yeah. but I want to no, I, I don't want to rush you, and I want to make sure that you have a chance to talk about whatever you want to talk about. So feel free. Yeah, and I think another reason, like a uh, a lot of people are like really, they're really. They, they get into pornography is because of, uh, I think a lot of people might be, this is sort of another like medical fiasco, a, a medical scandal, a really scandalous thing that's going on in medicine. It's even more scandalous than this. Well, maybe it's not even more scandalous. This orthodontist thing is incredibly scandalous. I mean, we're talking about 70% of kids that are getting th- something that like does horrible harm to their face and their airways, basically. 70% of American kids have braces. It's like a rite of passage. Um, it's incredibly scandalous. It's unnecessary and it's harmful, you know. Um, and uh, and if you're not getting braces, a lot of people are still messed up by this. Probably 80% of people have URS. And if you're not even, you know, getting URS, your pro- your sleep's probably messed up because you're mouth breathing while you're sleeping. But another scandalous thing in medicine is uh, circumcision. Do you know much about like circumcision and uh, the I've negative? Heard, I, I've heard about it. You know, I, I've I've heard that the foreskin is the most erogenous part of like the male, you know, sex mm-hmm. organ. It is. And yeah. so, like, I, I don't know. I don't know if it has any other function besides being erogenous, which is to say that it feels pleasure, and that kind of cu- yeah. cutting well, that off. Is, yeah. Why don't you tell it, us? It makes it makes it's it's hard because like. It's also important for like, like just the function. It, like it's a it's a part of your penis. You're not actually cutting around the penis. It's kind of a misnomer to say circumcised, cutting around. You're actually like cutting off a, a part of the penis, and it's uh, it's in, like it's it's important. It, it kind of acts as a natural lubricant, and the whole lubricant industry wouldn't even exist if we didn't have seventy percent of American men who were circumcised. You know, if you think about it, you wouldn't need lubricant if you're just having sex. It's just because people's you know they're they're genitalia got mutilated uh, without their consent, you know. Mm-hmm. Now they're forced to have sex in a less pleasurable way. And, you know, I, I'm not, I, I'm not like, I don't, I think vices are bad. I don't think, like, sex, I, I mean, people should be allowed to do whatever they want. But it's important to, like, to have a bond with someone. You know, if you're married with someone, you're not, like, if you're circumcised, you're never going to feel what sex naturally should feel like. And that's going to affect pair bonding. 
and your relationship with your wife, you know. So how does and that? She's not going to feel as good with it. Yeah, how does that work? So how does how does the how does the foreskin affect lubrication? I don't. How, I don't. I'm not sure. I understand. I, I don't, Can you? I'm not exactly sure, but um, it, I think it just like goes up and down or whatever. Right. Yeah. It has but, some, but like aside, it has some give to it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. But the long and like people who have got circumcised in adulthood, they have sex before and after. They're like, what, "Why did I do that? Like, it, I can't even feel anything anymore." You know what I'm saying? It's like really, and like I think that also predisposes people to watching pornography because you're not getting sex doesn't feel as good as it should, and so variety kind of substitutes for, you know, sex not feeling as good. You know? Yeah, Does I wonder if it's yeah, I wonder if it's tied in with other common uh sex issues that men have like erectile dysfunction premature ejaculation um you know in the whole gamut of 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 sex issues that are medicated and that are super oh, common it definitely causes premature ejaculation for sure but i think the most important issue of it is it's it's a huge trauma you know i mean you, you're coming r- right out of the womb and the first thing that happens to a lot of american men is they have the most sensitive part of their penis cut into you know what I'm saying? It's that's it's incredibly up. traumatic. Um, yeah. How a lot of the, people. Why be, aren't more people talking about this? Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think if, if people are interested in this, there's a good podcast, uh, Dream Eskimo. He has he, he talked with this guy about circumcision. He really went into depth with about it. Uh, he talks about circumcision on his Status of the Union podcast. But there's also this good. Uh, I forgot what it's called. I think Eric Klopper also did a good thing on circumcision. He did like a really deep dive on it at Harvard. He did this presentation on it. It was very, it was very good, very insightful. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, man. Maybe it's just like dogma. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it's the reason that uh, he says in his uh, podcast. He he kind of gets into that and that the reason Is why. Is he saying it's, there's it's like al- there's about. ulterior motives? Is that? Yeah, I, th- I think I think so. I think that's what he's getting at. Yeah. Do you think that's the case with orthodontics as well? I mean, possibly, because, I mean, if you think about it, like, like it's it's pretty obvious that uh, if you look at the archaeological record, that malocclusion is not genetic. It's clearly environmental. And John, he was writing articles about this in the 1980s. If you just think about it logically, people had very large jaws. They had room for all their wisdom teeth. Um, they didn't have they didn't have crooked teeth. And they obviously didn't have sleep apnea because they would be incredibly impaired. It would be an incredibly large, strong, selective pressure uh, against having sleep apnea. That did not exist in the Paleolithic era, 100%. There's no way. You would just die, you know? That's what yeah. I think. Yeah, sure. And I, don't, and I don't think it existed much in the medieval era as well. I think agriculture definitely contributed to it, but uh, I think the most important factor is breastfeeding, and I think I really want to harp on that because a lot of, like James Nestor, glossed over that in his uh, interview with Joe Rogan, and uh, it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's breastfeeding, you know? It's breastfeeding. It's not... I mean, chewing is important, but I think chewing only helps you mew insofar as it prevents mouth breathing and it also strengthens the tongue. And also, if you're eating sitting up straight, you're getting into the habit of mewing properly. You know, and that used to be a tradition a uni- universally ta- taught in almost every culture around the world. Uh, so, you know, traditions often have a lot of in- importance to them. Mm-hmm. What was I saying? Um, crap. Uh, crap, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Do you, do you remember what I was saying? <laughs> yeah, you were talking about... Uh, <laughs> you, you're like a machine gun. I'm going to start calling you Machine Gun Aiden. But you were talking <laughs> about... Um, what the hell were you talking about? Um, God damn. I was talking about <laughs> breastfeeding. That's yes, what I was yes. About. You were talking about the, the true source <laughs> of all of this. Yeah, because if you look at the skulls in, like, the medieval era, they all had their wisdom teeth, and they didn't really have malocclusion. It did exist. For example, George Catlin, he was this anthropologist. He went around to all these Indians, and all these Indians would call the Europeans black mouths because they were mouth breathing. And they were like, you know, me, you really? know, uh, they said, I like, I like, I, I, I hate white people that are mouth breathers, but I like white people that breathe through their nose is what they said, because uh, apparently they were just nicer. <laughs> what they said sure well you know who the hell likes a dirty mouth breather right yeah certainly not not women definitely not women i mean what's what's more dweeby than than a mouth breather right 
Nothing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and so it did, it did exist. Malocclusion did exist, but he went around in the 1860s, and the Industrial Revolution was already well underway. So allergens, when people started going into the countryside, into cities, that was a major change, right? If you look at a graph of the increase in malocclusion, it kind of slowly increased after the, the Neolithic Revolution, but it just took off after the Industrial Revolution and skyrocketed even more after the 1960s. And Mike Mead talks about this. It's uh, the most in... Uh, I think it's because the most important factor in it is uh, the lack of breastfeeding. Women, like, left in the 1960s, uh, women were liberated. They left the workplace, right, and uh, they uh, they stopped breastfeeding as much. And if that's the most important part of this, I think, because I agree. Like John, John Mew was talking about it. He says, yeah, if you if you give rats like uh, soft foods, it does give them like you know malocclusion. It does increase their malocclusion. But the most your, your skull is most malleable when you're a child, you know, your sutures are most open, and that's when you habi- you subconsciously habituate mewing. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, it's, it's just, I think that's the reason, you know, that's, I think people need to breastfeed more. People need to, yeah, that's, I mean, obviously you can, like, if you have, like, someone that's under the age of eight and they weren't breastfed, if you teach them proper tongue posture, that's going to do a, a world of difference for them. Mm-hmm. But the most important thing you can do for a kid is breastfeed them. And they were breastfeeding their children for up to like three to five years. Um, and now people don't even do it for like five months, if at all, you know? Yeah, if at all. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you. I'm a huge advocate of maximizing the time of breastfeeding. I think like minimum two years. I think the more the better. Yeah, I, I know Michael Jordan was breastfed till he was three. I know that in Mongolia um, and in a lot of uh, Muslim cultures uh, where breastfeeding is considered like a right of the child, they'll yeah. go up until age five or Why six. For sure. Because if you just think about it from, you know, an evolutionary biology point of view, you, you know, first things first, right? As soon as the baby comes out, well, what do we start with? What's the only real environmental factor that's in your control for the first year or two? It's it's just breastfeeding, right? Yeah. Like that's the thing. That's the way a baby can mew. How do you how do you get a baby to press his tongue up onto the roof of his mouth? Get him to suckle his mother's nipple, because when the baby yeah. reaches out and clasps the nipple, it trains the tongue to go up and forward, as compared to a bottle, which is yeah. longer and allows the baby to habituate having his tongue rests on the floor of his mouth, the milk just falls in, he doesn't even have to work for it. Mm-hmm. And then it, you know, when he's resting, when he's not suckling, if he's been breastfeeding, the tongue will just naturally go up and forward and serve as the natural palate expander. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this really started kicking off in the 1960s when, you know, women started, you know, they stopped being homemakers, you know. It just, there was a huge cultural shift, you know. Uh, and bre- I think that's breast- breastfeeding started being seen as like uh, oppressive, or you know yeah. somehow like uh, it's in, it's it's representative of women being subservient, and so yeah. so the baby sort of got thrown out with the bathwater, where you know yeah. something yeah, that was in it. fact good got associated with something that you know may be negative, which is women not having the liberty that they wanted, and so. You know, they stopped breastfeeding, not realizing that there would be huge negative effect on the baby that came from that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Let me get some papers. Sure. Yeah. One second. Ah. Okay, so this is an article about, like, kind of to your point of how, like, breastfeeding is seen as oppressive. I think this is really horrible. I'm not sure if the author of this was intentionally malicious when she wrote it, but her actions are certainly malicious whether she means it or not, because she's going to stop, she's going to discourage people from breastfeeding, as you'll see. So she says, the many, many costs of breastfeeding. Breastfeeding isn't free, and it isn't a solution to the national baby formula shortage. So this was written during the baby formula shortage, which I, I don't know if you heard about. But she was basically saying, you know, breastfeeding, women shouldn't be forced to do it. Um, so she says, data shows that mothers who breastfeed for six months or more experience longer and more severe income loss than mothers who for- formula feed. She shows a graph of income loss. And, like, 
I mean, sure, they lose income, but, you know, are, are women meant to be, like, workhorses? You know, this is, it's such, it's literally the most important job that you can do, raising the next generation of people, you know? And it's not even, it's not even, um, it's not even just the mechanical aspect of it, it's, it's the warmth, you know? The baby, a baby receives no other satisfaction than breastfeeding and other human contact. I mean, sure, you can give them other contact by holding them, but, like, that's, like, the only, th they, they can't, I'm sure they can't testify to it because they're, like, you know, children, but, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's the only satisfaction they receive. Also, like, what's interesting, there's this, he was this World War II veteran named George Lincoln Rockwell. He, uh, he wrote a book this time in the world, maybe someone would be interested in reading this, maybe people that listen to this would be interested in reading this, and he talks about how his mother was really, they were really pushing up, they were really pushing bottle, bottles on, uh, they were trying to bind up his, their, his, uh, wife's breast, he said, and give, give her pills that would dry up her breasts? This is what he said. I got my first lesson in the attitude of modern society in hospitals toward breastfeeding at the Bronxville Hospital, where Bonnie was born. The pressure on mothers to bind up their breasts, take pills, and do anything else to dry up the miraculous fountain of God-given life itself was terrific. It is little wonder to me that, so, that many of our children today are insecure, as the Freudians call it, when they have been denied the direct, warm animal contact with their mothers in their most helpless state. Babies can't testify to their sensations, of course, nor can they remember them, but I'm sure that if they could, a bottle-fed baby would feel just like a man whose wife handed him some kind of rubber mannequin to sleep with. Such a device could be manufactured to equal and perhaps exceed the mechanical performance of a human wife, but the mechanical stimulation is not all that is necessary. It is the indefinable warmth and love of the person which is the priceless ingredient, and how much more it must be so with a tiny helpless thing which has no other satisfaction at all. A baby lives entirely for contact and sustenance from its mother. When she purposefully and willfully denies it that warm contact and palms off a glass bottle full of milk meant for a cow mother's baby, no matter how scientifically it is mixed, she is starving that baby of the basic element of life, love, at the very time it should be filled and stuffed with over and overflowing with warmth and love. If the mother is unable to feed her child, no matter how hard she tries, then, of course, the bottle is the only solution. But it should be the last resort and relatively rare, instead of the present norm in so many cases. The whole thing is another manifestation of the corrosive and perverted idea of moderns, that it is somehow degrading to be a woman, to have babies, to nurse them, and to fulfill the animal functions of a woman. For my children's sake, I am happy to say I was able to prevail over my mother's dictum with Judy, and she lovingly nursed all the kids. Um, so, I mean, like, you can see how, like, this sort of started kicking off in the 1960s with the... Uh, you know, women's liberation. Yeah, that's extraordinarily yeah. upsetting, man. Like, yeah. to, to think about how bizarrely unnatural it really is to deprive a baby of that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that paired with circumcision, I mean, you're, you're, that's going to have profound... And pornography, internet, you're walking around... People are walking around just, like, totally different than they could be, totally robbed of their potential, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I agree right. with you. I agree yeah. with you, and these things are happening to to uh, children before they're at an age where they're able to have uh, they're able to advocate for themselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. it really does explain a lot about the way things have become in terms of the the mental health, especially of our the mm -hmm. boomer generation, but even millennials yeah. and even even boomers, because boomers mm -hmm. were the first to not be breastfed on mass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It, and so it really does contribute to the feminization of men. You know, men are some becoming more feminized and women are becoming more masculinized. And there it's really not a good thing. You really need that healthy tension. You know? It's really uh like for example, like let's see some testosterone. So this is your average Western man. Your average man. Damn, this glare is horrendous. You can't see the picture. Okay, there we go. So we got some soy boys there, you know, just full of estrogen. All of these, uh, they're clearly, their jaws are all clearly underdeveloped, sadly. I mean, they just have t terrible jaw development, you can tell. And I don't think it's because they had less testosterone at birth. They probably have less testosterone because they're not getting REM sleep. Does that make sense? Sure. They have, yeah. Chicken in the egg, it's probably a, a little bit of a uh, negative feedback loop to be stuck in. 
Yeah, you know, whether by coincidence or by design, the past few decades witnessed the most extreme changes in hormonal balance in history. You know, I mean, you can see, like, these are, th- I don't, I don't know. Uh, it's the, it's turn off I, the light. Turn off the light. Mm, a little bit I'll better. I'll turn it down to a lower setting. Okay. Okay, well, What's, you can kind of get... Well, for those who are just listening without visual, can you just explain the graph? Okay, so the median total testosterone of people from the uh, the years of between the 1980s, this is 1980, this is 1990, and this is the 2000s. So basically, median the blue is median total testosterone, and the uh, the yellow is median bioavailable testosterone. So they're both basically the same, but you can see they're going they're both going down. You see. So with each subsequent decade testosterone levels are sinking yeah and that could be for a variety of factors but i think this is probably the main cause of that what is what's the main cause uh uh sleep deprivation sleep lack of REM sleep right because sleep is obviously critical to the endocrine system and to the healthy regulation of hormones that's when most of your testosterone is produced and people aren't getting restful REM sleep either because they're mouth breathing or they're having flow limitations or they're just having outright apneas Mm-hmm. And this probably affects 80% of people, as I said. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, now we're running out of time here, but I, I wanted to go through like this uh, this article about breastfeeding. Sure. So, but the persistent myth that breastfeeding is free overlooks the real costs associated with breastfeeding, and like it's the article is really making it out that breastfeeding is this oppressive thing that's Wait, horrible. Wait, so are those women. those are piggy banks? Those are piggy banks on her so, uh, on her on her boobs. They're saying so, like you're wasting time breastfeeding, and like women should be working instead of breastfeeding. So and the argument is that breastfeeding is costing women money. Yeah. So the so the very simple response to that is, well, now you're going to have to pay orthodontic fees and other yeah. medical fees, and mm-hmm. you're going to have to spend all this money compensating for your child's lack of. Natural mental health. health. Yeah. You know, it, you're going to have to co- and, spend money compensating on your child's lack of mental health. Uh, you're going to have to spend money on special athletic trainers because your child is not going to be athletic because he's going to have a poor mm-hmm. airway. Like, mm-hmm. that, the one or two years you could spend breastfeeding, I think, are a fantastic financial investment mm-hmm. because you're just saving yeah. so much money coming down the pike in terms of expenses dealing with. Yeah. And I've seen it, man. Like, when a kid isn't breastfed and he becomes a mouth breather, <clears throat> that's when babies start getting ear infections and stuff. Like, as soon yeah. as they stop being breastfed, they start becoming a mouth breather. Now they start getting ear infections. Now the mother's got to take time out of work to take the kid to the hospital. And she's she's losing out on money in that regard. Like, financially, it's not even close. The way better also, investment is to take yeah. a couple of years to just breastfeed. Yeah, and it's also, it's good for the mother, too. I mean, people, it's like the most natural thing you can do. You're connecting with your baby. But also, IQ and good looks are probably the most important factors in success in life. And if, you have, if you're sleep-deprived as, as a child, according to Dr. David Gorzal, you can lose up to 10 to 20 IQ points. And each wow. IQ point is associated with a loss of $170,000 over your lifetime. So basically, these kids are losing out of millions of dollars of potential earnings. And just think about this on a society-wide level, the effects if like all of this was corrected, how much more productive everyone in society would be. We would just have such a well-working society. Everyone would be happier and work together. People would be coming up with so many more ideas. Do you see what I'm saying there? I definitely do. And people would also if have... Everyone had, if everyone had 10 more IQ points and didn't have... You know what I'm saying? And imagine if everyone had more them. testosterone and more uh, aggression, right? Like they would probably be less likely to deal with oppression in tyranny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, for sure, yeah. I mean, basically, like, all these people are just walking around like mindless zombies. You're really susceptible to propaganda if you just if your prefrontal cortex isn't working, for God's sakes. You're very emotional, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just very, you're very susceptible to fear of propaganda. Oh, I'm scared of this. Yeah, one, anyway. last, uh, one last point about, yeah. Um, yeah, what's that? Oh. Oh sorry. Oh sorry, it's the wrong picture. Uh, one second. Yeah, let me uh, let me share a little uh, a little piece of anti breastfeeding propaganda that I've come across recently. There's this show. I think it's Netflix. Uh, it's called mm-hmm. it's called The Baby. 
Have mm-hmm. you seen it or heard of it at all? No. It's about no. this demonic baby that ba- basically this this woman gets stuck with, and everyone who this baby comes in contact with dies by some freak violent death. There's this mm-hmm. scene. So the main character is this woman who is who who starts off being super anti baby, and she like looks at her friend's baby babies, and she's like, "Why would you ever do that? Like, why wouldn't you?" Well, why would you ever want to be a mother and have to deal with that crap, basically? And there's yeah. this there's this scene where um, she's having this dream, and the the demonic baby latches onto her nipple, mm-hmm. and at first she she has this like orgasmic release when the baby latches on and starts taking milk. Mm-hmm. She's like she gives us like one of these like oh, like it's such a relief that the baby is suckling uh, milk, yeah. and then the baby starts biting her nipple and it starts it starts oozing blood and then Ooh. the baby turns into this evil demon baby <laughs> and like it looks like oh. a little devil oh so like who, i see like, like who is gonna watch we that scene this from that baby seriously right who's gonna watch that scene and be like oh i want to go breastfeed my kid <laughs> now definitely affects you know the subconscious mind i suppose whether it was intentional or not you know that's gonna be like it's gonna stick back there maybe well, definitely. It's just toxic, you know, it's it's toxic media. It's totally like uh, uh, bad vibes that are being put yeah. out there into the consciousness of women who are considering having babies and breastfeeding them. Yeah. Hmm. Also, what, what do you think about uh, dreaming and DMT? Do you think... Do you think you produce DMT in dreams? I'm sure you've, you're a fan of Joe Rogan, and many people listening would probably be fans of Joe Rogan. Do you think you produce DMT while you're while you're dreaming? I have no idea. That? I have no idea. Um, I think it's people are only speculated because you hallucinate on uh, DMT, and like there's the waking hallucinations are similar to dreams, and DMT is found endogenously in the brain, but it's only speculation. It's just interesting. Like, I was wondering if there's a, I don't know, if people connect more with God, maybe. This is kind of more wild speculation. That's not really as provable as the cause of malocclusion being environmental. But perhaps, you know, you lose a connection with God if you're just totally, you know, zombied out. And maybe, like, I, I didn't use, I used to not dream. I never dreamed as a kid. And now I started dreaming. And I think maybe that had a factor in me becoming religious again. Huh. So um, you're saying they call that... call DMT the God molecule. Right, or the spirit molecule, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you're saying that uh, poor facial structure results in poor sleep, which causes DMT production to basically not occur. And yeah. so now, uh, because of the lack of DMT, which is the Miles spirit molecule or the, or the God molecule, perhaps ultimately underdeveloped facial structure is resulting in poor connection with the divine. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, like, after I started using my uh, CPAP machine, I'd go on walks, and I was like, wow, you know, I just, like, I felt like everything had to be this way, and that someone had to create it, you know? I felt like God created the world. I would just go on these walks, and I was like, there has to be a God. Mm -hmm. You know, there wasn't even any, like, logic behind it. I just, like, it's like the Holy Spirit, you know? Yeah, it's like a, it's it's just a, it's a feeling you have, like like a, like an Mm -hmm. instinct to connect with the Holy Spirit that you feel yeah. just in virtue of getting better sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, I, I think it's feasible. Possible. I mean, that's just wild speculation. I just thought I'd add that in. Well, the the I idea that... Discredit me because I'm sure there's a lot of atheists listening. They're going to be like, oh, I'm going to throw out everything he said. I mean, I don't know. Well, I mean, you don't need to be a theist to, to believe that things that occur in the body can affect your mystical experience of the world. If you just look at Buddhist yeah. monks... Uh, in the things that they put their bodies through in order to enhance the mystical, then it's it's clear that there's obviously a connection between the body and the ability to have mystical experiences. You know, fasting is another thing that's associated with ha- having a heightened sense of the mystical. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't see... Oh, yeah, I used to fast a lot. Yeah, I, I started fasting a lot. That's something I definitely couldn't have done because I didn't have the willpower to do. Mm-hmm. When I had sleep apnea, and I just I really liked fasting. Like mm-hmm. I fasted like long extended fasts. Those, those are super spiritual, man. I recommend anyone listening. You ought to go on a fast sometime. It's not that dangerous, you know. Yeah, yeah. And every if you think about it evolutionarily, people were going on fast for weeks at a time, you know, just constantly. Definitely, and a lot of animals still do that. I mean, if you just turn on mm-hmm. any any uh, you know nature documentary, 
you'll learn that like oh this animal eats you know once every two weeks or whatever and it'll you know it'll get one one good kill every once in a while and it'll just live off that otherwise it's in yeah. a state of fasting yeah the keto diet is definitely the natural mode of human beings to run on ketone bodies but you know i recommend everyone try that at least once and see how it works for you i tried that i liked it but i think i i, I think i work like a, i frame houses and so i don't i don't know if that would be conducive to that I, I eat carbohydrates, but uh, you know, it could be it could work for you. I recommend at least trying it once. I think you know what I'm you know what I'm saying. Sure, it definitely works for you. I think you have a you do a keto diet, right? Yeah, I do. Well, I do a uh, sort of an animal based keto diet, sort of along the lines mm -hmm. of the paleolithic ketogenic diet, a la uh, paleo medicina. So it's like, you know, I do like seventy. I eat twice a day, and they're not huge meals, um, but yeah, and there's probably 75 percent animal based mm -hmm. and uh but i will have you know some amount of carbs to like wrap up a meal and like just to hit yeah. the spot there before finishing up um, normally yeah. i just try to have my sweet dessert thing to end the meal just be like some dark chocolate or something but i'll occasionally mm -hmm. have some bread and butter or some rice yeah. or some vegetables that that have some you know carb carbohydrate in them mm -hmm. um yeah so Hey man, just mm -hmm. wrapping. I've got to wrap now. Um, okay. But why don't you tell us like what like so you just said that you're a, you're framing houses now. So you're 20 years old. You're obviously highly intelligent. What are your plans? Like what are you uh, gonna well, what are you gonna do with your life? I was thinking about going to college, maybe maybe becoming like a software engineer. I used to think it like I wouldn't have the aptitude for it. I was always terrible at math in school. I used to be really good at math before my orthodontic treatment. I was in like the advanced math class, but then I fell off that track after I got orthodontics. So I don't know much about math, but I'm sure maybe if I went to college and did it, I could get back into it. Maybe I, I was thinking about applying for some universities, even though I was 20. But since like I'm, I sleep well, I exercise now. I'm doing a lot of good things. You know, I think I could probably pick it up, maybe. I know they make a lot of money, but, I mean, carpenters don't make that much money. It probably wouldn't be the best profession, but I like it, you know. It's, you know, my last name is Hauser. Uh, it, it's kind of a fitting name. Maybe I could start a framing company, you know. Hauser Houses. <laughs> or the Hauser. Yeah. No, I think that's great. Look, I've done a lot of working with my hands, and if you want to talk things that are, like, natural, right, mm -hmm. like, natural human working. activities sort of like breastfeeding mewing exercising working with your hands to build things and fix things definitely mm -hmm. ticks a lot of those dopamine boxes and just feels no man right. i like it you know for and sure like i've totally unhooked from the internet from the past month and i have like a totally new default mode i was able to read the lord of the rings like through and through just like and i read like for like two or three hours a day and that was unthinkable when i was using internet and wasn't sleeping well and I just, I just try to not use the internet passively. It's just horrible for your brain, you know. Couldn't the agree internet more. Is a fantastic resource, a fantastic resource. I would have never have figured out all of this without the internet. I might have been dead by now. I might have killed myself. Um, but uh, yeah, just uh, you gotta, you gotta limit it. You gotta not use it passively. It is an addiction, you know. Yeah. Most people are addicted to the internet. For sure. And on this note, I like to come back to Cal Newport. He's basically, you know, one of the foremost experts in the, in the field of disconnecting. He's got a book called Digital Minimalism, uh, where he talks about using technology to your advantage, getting the best out of it while avoiding the worst. And like you, he also defaults to reading rather than defaulting to his smartphone. And so mm -hmm. he's able to read, uh, on average, five books a month. And that's he, a lot. He, he, that's I a huge slow amount. Reader myself. What's that? I'm a slow reader myself. Yeah, so I think he mixes audio books with, with the actual physical books. Well, I love audio books. Yeah, those are good. That's For a great sure. resource. And he basically mm -hmm. says read any way that you can, whether it's audio or whatever. Audio books are just so much better than short little YouTube clips because those short YouTube mm -hmm. clips are just like, you know, feeding into that need for high fructose media. Mm -hmm. They're like short, and then yeah. you've got to get back into the YouTube, you know, scroll screen where you've got to choose something else. So an audio book, even though it is... You know, not actually sitting there with a book is a far superior thing for you to engage with than like a string of, you know, six YouTube videos over the course of an hour. Yeah. But yeah, defaulting to reading rather than your smartphone can be an extraordinarily powerful habit to develop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cal also talks about embracing boredom 
which is getting yeah. to kind of like unwinding uh, the that the that amygdala disruption that you're yeah. talking about. Learning meditating to be, is good for that as well. I've, I've started meditating. Yeah, it's it's very good. Just, just focus on your breath, man. When you get distracted, keep focusing on your breath. Mm -hmm. Just you know, just use it. Yeah, it's worth it's worth uh, practicing. So, anyway, man, I'll let you go. Uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks for all your insight, yeah. and we'll definitely have to do this again because I'm sure you have a lot okay. more you'd like to add. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah. I'd be happy to if you'd like to, yeah. All right, Aiden. Take care, man. Okay. It was great talking to you. All right, you as well. Bye-bye.